thank you so much for that warm introduction, Emma, and thank you, George, for extending this invitation. It's a real honor to speak at an institution as esteemed as this one. Um, I also understand that you are here on your own will, free will. This is, you don't have to be here. <laughs> uh, so I feel like at 6.30 at night on a Tuesday, I have to thank all of the students who have come. Um, and I want to double click on that. When, when you're passionate about something, you don't have to be pushed, you're pulled. And if you keep listening to that little voice and following your interests, it's a real edge. And, um, and so I just encourage you to keep doing exactly like you've done tonight. Be intellectually curious, come out, learn, engage. And in that spirit, what I want to do is actually keep my prepared remarks as short as possible. I'm probably breaking the rules, George, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then I want to kind of engage with you and really get into a bit of a debate about putting value investing into practice. And then we'll go to Q&A. How's that sound? So as a CIO of an investment management firm, you need a clear plan for how to navigate the uncertain future. It's not easy. But at Wincrest, our core value is value investing. And we don't change our core value in response to market changes. Rather, we change markets to remain true to our value investing principles. So value investing is probably so ingrained in me because as Emma told you, at the age of 15, I asked Sir John Templeton, the grandfather of value investing, for a summer internship. After a summer, he said I, he thought I should meet the CIO of Templeton. His name was Mark Holowesco, and he was running the two largest mutual funds in the world at the time, the Templeton Foreign Fund and the Templeton Growth Fund. And so the first thing I did for Mark was an investment recommendation on General Mills. And I went away and I studied the company and I tried to present it to him. And he looked at me and he said, did you look at the convertible? And by the look on my face, I could tell he thought I was talking about a car. <laughs> so he walked me over to the FT showed me uh, the convertible yield and asked me to study an option I was legally old enough to drive. So that's how I got started. And I just never left. I loved it. I went back every single summer. Um, and like Sir John, when I was a student, I wanted to explore the, the world. Unlike Sir John, I didn't travel on my poker winnings, but rather on the monies Templeton paid me during my consecutive summer internships. I was also fortunate enough to attend boarding school in Hong Kong during the Asian crisis, which made it affordable to backpack through Bangkok and <coughs> Vietnam and Bangladesh, and those are all countries we invest in today. So having witnessed the growth in that region firsthand over the last two decades, I'm always perplexed that while most of the world's population lives in emerging markets, so few people invest in them. Exploring the world with a laptop is as much fun as it was with a backpack. As my former colleague, Nick Brady, who is the Treasury Secretary of the United States, explains in his autobiography, phone calls, annual reports, the computer, whatever will get you started. But ultimately, you've got to get out there and give it a go-see. When it comes to investing, especially in emerging markets, there is no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings, walking factory floors, meeting competitors, and soaking in the nuances that are virtually impossible to read about in an annual report. Last year, the Wincrest research team spoke to 247 com com companies, conducted 36 meetings with research analysts, attended 21 broker conferences in six different countries. The benefit of meeting so many companies and so many industries in so many countries is that it enables you to triangulate what you're hearing, reading, and seeing. It helps with clarity. It helps build conviction. Let's test your clarity and conviction. It's pretty hard. So by way of hands, how many of you deem the square labeled A to be darker than B? OK, so about 50% of you? By covering the shadow, I have not changed the facts. I've just freed your mind 
to see things as they are and not as you perceive they should be or may be. The moral of this slide is you get what you inspect, not what you expect. It's been a tough time for value investors. We have been in the longest bull market in history until about this week. <laughs> Who needs value, downside protection, or even diversification for that matter? Shouldn't we all just go buy market cap weighted ETFs, become free money, uh, become passive money free riders, and enjoy the last laugh? Or should we stay true to our values and be selling when others are greedy? Missed price money has created bubbles everywhere to the extent that some call this the everything bubble. Investors have been so obsessed with tech and the US market, for the enterprise value of Apple, you can buy all of the companies in three of the largest markets of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, or all of the companies in the three largest markets of Eastern Europe, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Nearly three times over. This isn't normal, nor is it rational. It is a clear sign of mania when the market thinks one company has a brighter future than a few countries combined. But rather than talking about the problem, let's focus on how to monetize the opportunity. The opportunity here is that when bubbles emerge, so do anti-bubbles. In the 80s, Japan accounted for 15% of global GDP, but it attracted 50% of all the money invested in stock markets globally. Despite healthy growth and valuation fundamentals at that time, as unfathomable as it seems today, the US was the anti-bubble to Japan. If we look at the tech bubble of the 1990s, the NASDAQ traded at a PE of 245 times. During that time, the Templeton Growth Fund proclaimed itself the anti-NASDAQ fund. But as they always do, anti-bubbles have formed in countries and companies that have a bright future, but struggle to attract the attention of investors. In his book, The Future is Asian, Parag Khanna explains that of the 30 trillion in extra middle-class consumption expected by 2030, only one trillion will come from the West. So the most important region and sector for us to get right today is the Asian consumer. And thankfully, it's also the anti-bubble. Anti-bubbles have one thing in common with bubbles, and that is that they don't last. Eventually, logic prevails, and investors return to looking for the inexpensive growth stories which they find amongst the forgotten companies and countries. Wincrest is currently net short the US with an overweight in emerging markets. That's a pretty bold move when your index is the MSCI all country world with 56% weighting in the US. But we're not afraid of being contrarian because we've done our work. We are positioned this way because we think the US is expensive and slowing, while emerging markets are cheap and growing. The combination of interest rates collapsing from 15% in 1980 to what are they today? Does anyone know? 1%, yeah. 1% exactly. Two, in 1980, we had a, the, game, the rules of the game changed. In 1980, Management companies weren't allowed to buy back their own shares. Today, they're manipulating earnings by excessive buybacks. Three, you've had an unprecedented consolidation of industries, which has created outsized profits. And four, these technology companies have created monopoly rents. And all of this has caused the S&P to rise by 2,727% since 1980. We believe this boom, we don't believe it's repeatable, and we don't question if it's, and we question if it's sustainable. In our estimation, going forward, it is as unlikely that the US will enjoy the magnitude of tailwinds that it has, as it is likely 
that emerging markets will. And let me give you an example. One in four houses in the US has not one, but two refrigerators. We can't see that number doubling. However, in Bangladesh, only one in five houses has a refrigerator. So we can easily see that number doubling. The fund owns the largest and dominant market share company in white goods in Bangladesh. Similarly, average shoe ownership in India is 1.6 pairs per person, which is a number we believe can double. The fund holds the largest footwear manufacturer in India. Apart from operating in an underpenetrated market that has the potential to grow 100% in the next five years, we have an alignment of interest with the largest and founding shareholder of this shoe company. The company has an impeccable balance sheet with just 0.2 times net debt to EBITDA, interest expense is covered 29 times, and revenue grew 18% last year with a 21% return on equity, 28% return on capital employed, and 16% EBITDA margin. So diversification by country enables us to reduce the geopolitical risk of any one specific emerging market without sacrificing attractive growth and valuation characteristics at the portfolio level. There isn't one country that could bring down the portfolio. And if you have a, a terrorist attack in a country, say Indonesia, it's not going to affect what's happening in Egypt. And so that's how we think of diversifying our risk. And we dedicate our time to, undercovering, to uncovering these undervalued stocks, wherever in the world they may be. Then, in the words of Sir John Templeton, some other time, when people are overly excited, bidding, up, bidding prices up higher and higher in their anxiety to buy, we accommodate them and sell them those stocks we bought years before. So we're often asked, how do you cover the world? You're a small team. And what I'd say to that is, the world is a big place, but it's not if you know what you're looking for. We troll in the mid-cap space, fishing for niche companies with dominant market share and very little debt. In over 80% of the long positions in our fund, we have a strong alignment of interest with the founder, who are still the largest shareholder in the company. As a former triathlete, a sector I'm drawn to is the publicly listed gym sector. We have actually held every company on this slide with exception of company D. That company is Planet Fitness in the US. Company B, the gym group, is disrupting and democratizing the health club industry in the UK. It's the Frontier Airlines, uh, or you know, the, the uh, Spirit Airlines of gyms. They charge £17.50 per month. You can join by the month, and they're open 24 hours a day. The founder and chair of the board has a goal to conquer the tube map with a gym at every tube station. The company grows at a 25% compound annual growth rate, and it's inexpensive on 15 times earnings and 6 times EBITDA. Gym Group deems the market opportunity to be 250 gyms, and they think it'll take them five years to get there. So assuming a mature gym makes a million pounds of revenue and has a 40% EBITDA margin, which is conservative, because actually their EBITDA margin today is 47.5%, that would mean this company has earnings power of 250 million in revenue and 100 million in EBITDA. If you put 100 million of EBITDA on a 10 times multiple, you get a valuation of about a billion. And today's market cap is 290 million. And there's upside to that if the gym group can keep margins in the mid 40 percent range. So this is an interesting stock because I take comfort in the margin of safety in knowing that private equity bought its competitor, Pure Gym, before it could even complete its IPO roadshow process at seven turns of EBITDA higher than the gym group trades for today. Sometimes, as Sir John Templeton said, the best bargains are not the stocks whose prices are down the most, but rather 
those stocks having the lowest prices in relation to their earnings power in future years. And we do a lot of that at Wincrest. We look at private market valuations um, because while passive money can be indiscriminate, private equity is discriminate. And if things are trading too cheaply, they will come in, and that's a source of price discovery for us. Um, we don't have anything against company A. It's the European player, basic fit. And in fact, we sold it to buy a cheaper gym business, company C. We felt company C had a better balance sheet and underappreciated growth potential. The name of that company is Lee Jam. We found Lee Jam in Saudi Arabia. With 13% market share, Lee Jam is the largest gym operator in Saudi. At the end of 2019, the company had 140 gyms and a quarter of a million members. The Saudi market currently has 1,000 gyms, which are mainly single gym operators. When we benchmark this opportunity to UK gyms per capita, it suggests the Saudi gym market could be three, three and a half thousand gyms. And given Lee Jam's strong brand name, leading market position, and expansion plan, Lee Jam should continue to enjoy double digit market share in a secular growth market. Saudi is an interesting country. It has a young population, and 70% of the population is currently under the age of 40. Recent political and societal changes in Saudi are a strong tailwind for the business. As of July 2017, female gyms were allowed in Saudi Arabia, and as of June 2018, Saudi women can drive themselves there. <coughs> female gyms are a key growth opportunity for this company because they're so profitable. They have a one to three month payback versus 12 months for the male gyms, which have a lot more expensive equipment. But the women show up at 9 a.m. as if they're going to the office. They buy a Starbucks there, they do a class, they buy their lunch there, they lounge, they do another class, they go home. Female, yeah, so, so our variant perspective on this was when we asked the company how many of the gyms they were opening were gonna be female gyms, and it was a disproportionate num a percentage of the pipeline, I quickly realized that wasn't in the numbers. So that's where we started getting really in interested in the company. Um, and on 12 and a half times earnings with a 24% ROE, 15% compound annual growth rate, net debt to EBITDA of just 1.1 times, and a 2.8% dividend yield, Lee Jam is attractively priced, and we take comfort in our alignment of interest with a founding family who still own 60% of the company. By maintaining a watch list of a few hundred companies that we would love to own at the right price, through sheer patience, we are sometimes lucky enough to pick up what we call fallen angels. Mispriced, but not mismanaged, is an excellent form of value. New Oriental Education is the largest and most reputable provider of after-school tuition classes in China. New Oriental has 3.5% market share in the 6 million student market, which means the after-school tutoring market is still very fragmented. Yet a third of all Chinese students attending after-school tutoring in China as, oh, yet a third of all students in China attend after-school tutoring because English is not taught in the state schools. I've always admired this company, but I've never owned it for fear that I'd get a nosebleed trying to pay the punchy multiple it demanded. In 2018, I finally got the opportunity to pick this angel up when she'd fallen 50% from grace. This was a case of macro volatility creating micro opportunity. The entire sector got sold off because the Chinese government said they were going to enact regulatory changes to ensure teachers had qualifications and the centers were of a certain standard. We'd done our homework and over 98% of their teachers did have qualifications and because they were the largest and best funded player, their centers were of standard. So our variant perspective on this news was actually, this was a positive for New Oriental Education because it would force the smaller non-compliant players to exit the market and they would pick up market share. 
We've now made over 140% on this investment, but it's still in the portfolio because the consolidation thesis is now starting to play out nicely. New Oriental has 1,000 after-school tuition centers today and plans to expand to 2,000. We think this is completely doable. Um, and in South Korea, for example, which is the most advanced after-school tutoring market, um, where after-school penetration rate is 70%, um, and households spend $238 a month on private education, is a good barometer because penetration in China is nowhere near 70%. It's 38%, and they're spending $34 a month. Um, and the Gaokao, um, as I said, English is not taught in state schools. So I could talk about our longs all day, but what they have in common is they are all simple stories that were found using a common sense approach to investing. Disruption. In an expensive world, there's another opportunity, and that is to short. Sir John loved to short. For example, he used to autom almost systematically short lockup IPOs. And just as Sir John did, at Wincrest, we view shorts as a source of profit, not a hedge. We call them alpha shorts. Companies operating in industries that are in secular decline, that took on far too much cheap debt, and are cyclically exposed and face disruption will become zombie companies. As Stan Druckenmiller says, we live in the greatest period of disruption, yet there aren't any bankruptcies. Innovation is doing the same things a bit better, whereas disruption is making things that make the old things obsolete. Disruption threatens the viability of existing business models. <laughs> Companies have shorter and shorter life cycles today than ever before. This may explain why value investors have had such a difficult time in recent years. Disruptors have made countless value traps out of traditionally safe industries. When an industry gets disrupted, the incumbents experience multiple compression. And every company I'm going to talk about next looks cheap relative to its historical valuation. But neither the multiple nor the earnings power will come back unless they disrupt themselves. These companies are not anti-bubbles. They are melting ice cubes. And this is where the judgment part of investing comes in, is knowing the difference. And it's not that these industries are moving so fast that these companies have no time to adjust to the change. Rather, it's that their boards and management teams believe the changes won't affect their company. They're driving with the rearview mirror. These shorts would all screen as screaming lungs for a value investor on a Bloomberg screen. So you can't find them that way. You have to uncover shorts by taking the time to meet with management teams. <coughs> For example, over-levered TV broadcasters are a terrific example of companies in decline that are facing structural headwinds that cyclical headwinds will only exacerbate. Globally, TV is losing its share of the advertising pie because your eyeballs are moving online. TV's loss of advertising share is being made even worse by the rise of Netflix and Amazon Prime and the like. Simply put, the industry is in denial of being disrupted. You and I see it, but the big companies are doing surprisingly little about it. So this is a short that we've made well over 40% on. It's Mediaset. And Mediaset and Atris Media in Spain have an effective duopoly with 80% of all TV advertising spend in Spain. But it's a particularly vulnerable market to this theme because TV is still 35% of advertising spend there. Whereas in Germany, it's already 22%. In the UK, it's 21%. And if network TV audiences decline, and as a result, advertising revenues do too, these companies, who both make 90% of their revenues from advertising, will be in trouble. Netflix penetration in Spain is estimated to be 
and the penetration rate grows at 4% a year, which means Netflix is on a trajectory to reach a 20% penetration rate in three years' time in Spain. When Netflix penetration hit 20% in the US, that was a real tipping point that caused TV advertising to meaningfully decline. We expect this to occur even sooner in Spain because Span Spanish language content is a major focus for Netflix today. So in the absence of mitigating measures, earnings could more than halve for media set because like all broadcasters, they are highly operationally geared do their high fixed cost base. For example, these broadcasters earn, for every dollar these broadcasters earn in revenue, it's 80%, 80 cents of operating profit. So that operating leverage works well when revenues increase, but it's a double edged sword when revenues decrease. Even just flat revenue growth against a rising cost base in line with inflation would see operating profits fall by 10%. And flat revenue is a dream. Duopoly as they may be, Mediaset and, At and Atris Media are a weak duopoly that have entered into a price war on advertising. Any weakness in the Spanish economy will only add to concerns around growth for these stocks, especially as there's a high correlation between advertising spend and corporate profitability. We are exposed to this theme through selective shorts and TV broadcasters in the US and UK as well. Another theme for us is debt and price discovery. At Wincrest, we've been brave enough to short something as sure as death. We actually made 50% in a day in this short. The name of the company is Dignity, and it's the UK's largest funeral provider. They had a decade-long roll-up strategy of levering up 4.4 times net debt to EBITDA to buy small family-run funeral homes, and that resulted in the company commanding over 30% market share in terms of funeral revenues in the UK. What the company then did was they began raising prices 5 to 6% a year. So this short was visceral for me. When my grandmother passed away, the coroner came and tried to sell our mourning family a coffin that was priced more like a car. And I questioned it, and my family got really upset with me. You know, isn't your grandmother worth her coffin? And I could see what the guy was doing. This was, a, you know, the opacity, he's playing on emotions, uh, you only have a few days. Anyway, so when I found the opportunity to short this company, <laughs> I thought, I'll get the last laugh. <laughs> so, um, so, so in the case of Dignity, you had fixed costs and rising prices, which resulted in 40% operating margins, which began to attract what? Competition. But the proverbial nail in Dignity's coffin was a website that brought price discovery to this opaque market. www.funeralbookers.com meant you could put your postcode in and it would show you pricing in, in your neighborhood. And when you think about it, when my grandmother died, I opened the yellow pages and it told me nothing about pricing. So when we challenged the company on what they were going to do about their recent loss in market share, they said, don't worry about it. We're going to spend a million pounds a year on online advertisement. I said, well, I don't know if that's going to kill more people, but good luck. <laughs> we waited another quarter. And sure enough, market share had kept, uh, continued to decline. And they said, well, we're going to spend an additional million, dollars, million pounds a year on online advertisement. And then they said, and as of today, we're going to cut funeral prices by 25%. So what happened? You had higher expenses, lower revenue. You were already 4.4 times net debt to EBITDA. So on the new math, you're trading at an applied 5.5 times net debt to EBITDA, and your liabilities now exceed your market cap, which is why the stock was down 50% in a day. So another theme in our short book 
is debt and, disrupt and debt and disruption. So you're, you're finding a theme here, right? They're all debt something, debt and denial, <laughs> debt and disruption. Um, TUI is a package tour holiday company. Is anyone familiar with the company? Any Europeans in the room? Yeah, I see one, okay. So this is a tour company that is selling package tours primarily through the high street, a travel agency. And they own the planes, the cruise ships, and the hotels in their bundled package. And they're competing with well-funded online asset light platforms such as Expedia, TripAdvisor, Booking.com. And even now, if you book a, a ticket through Ryanair or uh, EasyJet, they're trying to add, you know, do you want to rent a car, right? So, so all of this is accelerating the disintermediation of holiday bookings. But on 6.8 times earnings with an 8% dividend yield, TUI screens well. But this is an example of a classic value trap. TUI is an extremely levered business with low margins and a poor capital structure with significant future liabilities in terms of pension and aircraft leases and capital commitments. Additionally, TUI has a complex holding structure with JV minority positions, which means equity holders only own 50% of the things they see on the balance sheet. Meanwhile, analysts are overly focused on headline adjusted EBITDA. Always be careful when you see adjusted. Nobody adjusts up or, or for something negative, right? Um, so, and what they should be looking for is free cash flow. So the free cash flow is half of net income on a normalized basis. So this is what you get when you dig into numbers. And for a fund that's laser focused on alignment of interest, we also saw a huge red flag. In the company's shareholder presentation, free cash flow was 213 million euro, whereas when management declined, defined free cash flow for the purposes of their bonuses, free cash flow magically ballooned to 760 million euro because management excluded tax, interest, and pension contributions. Wouldn't it be nice if the equity guys could do that too? And on the basis of management's free cash flow calculation, TUI paid seven board members 30 million in bonuses in 2018, seven million of which went to the CEO. So even though TUI is free cash flow negative due to heavy investments and high restructuring charges, TUI's executives protected themselves from these costs due to the games they played with their compensation schemes. So this is the type of misalignment that we're looking for. So TUI went into 2019 guiding for positive 10% EBITDA growth through 2020. Double digit, they said. Let's be conservative and call that 10. There wasn't another travel company that was growing 10% last year. You had Brexit, you had weak consumer confidence. And so we decided to short. In February, TUI cut their guidance to flat EBITDA, and they blamed the weather and Brexit, of course. And that's where you see that first dip. And then in April, TUI announced that EBITDA would now be down 17% year on year due to the grounding of the Boeing 737 in its fleet. And if their 737s weren't flying by June, they said EBITDA would be down 25%. This magnitude of swing in EBITDA is just not possible, particularly when the 737 was only 10% of the airline fleet. So this is a short we continue to hold, and who knows what they'll blame next, but a dividend cut must be around the corner. Another theme that we're excited about is something called popping the profitless prosperity bubble. There are a slew of IPOs that came to the market last year and are coming to the market this year. And as private companies, businesses such as WeWork, Uber, Lyft, they grew revenue and losses at almost equal rates. Yet, like bubbles do, 
they continued to attract capital at higher and higher valuations. I don't know who the buyer of a money-losing company that has run out of funding that a bank won't lend to is. And their Series A, B, Z through Z investors are more likely to be counting the days until their lockup expires than how much more money they can put in. According to The Economist, 84% of the companies that IPO'd last year had no profits. The last time it was that high was the peak of the dot-com boom. And I think you're starting to see that. And you know what I'd say is value investing has had a difficult decade. But principles are principles, and the value investing principles has not changed. What has changed is the price of money. And that's what I think has created some really interesting um, long and short opportunities. Long or short, hands up. Who thinks Carnival Cruise Lines is a long? OK. Anyone want to go short? OK, great. Love it. All right, so talk to me about why it might be a short. Sure. Um, people are going to be spooked to try this turns into a pandemic. They're not going to make any money for the next year. They've got lots of expensive cruise ships to pay for, leases to pay for. They've got to pay staff. They've got to cover all sorts of huge fixed costs. They have to pay births for ports and all sorts of other stuff. And they're probably not going to be making a lot of money in your near future. So odds are, you've already seen that share price is probably going to go through four even further. Is it a zero? No, it won't go bang up, but it will go probably down to 20 ish or, you know, if not further. Why 20 ish? Just randomly looking at things, yes. <laughs> so I guess where I would say is how would you get comfortable with the floor? What is the margin of safety? How would you think about that? I would think about it in reverse. At what level, of what price would I be willing to go in if it were going, things were going the other way? So at that point in time, I would look for that to be my floor on a short. Okay. Anyone think it's a zero? No zeros. Okay. All right. Um, someone who thought it might be a long. Any volunteers as to why? The, I don't know if you look at how long SARS lasted for, how long tourism was impacted for, the short-term cash flows may be in impacted but the total valuation of business is going to be a part of it by what this virus will impact even if you extrapolate that to around six months a year before people start going on holidays again so if people are then discounting years like one through five eight ten whatever takes up the rest of the valuation then i think it could be a long opportunity in what time frame i feel like if i were taking yes it would be with if you look at like the uh disease curves of like previous outbreaks and understanding like when those things start to turn around, I guess choosing the bottom would then be guessing how many months in you'd want to, uh, like how many months from now you want to enter the, the time frame, that's what you're asking. Yeah, and I, I guess, um, let me put it another way and we'll ask somebody else. Um, one of the interesting things about buying a stock is what's your time horizon, right? And um, if you can hold something for longer, it's typically an advantage. So if I were to say to you, do you, for people that thought it was long, are you thinking it's a quick reversion and it'll be up 20% in a month, or are you thinking it's a multi-year long? Yeah. Uh, I'm short of this last week, and I've covered today at 3.55 p.m. Ah, well done. So, uh, I, I think it is ultimately a long, I just don't know when, and I don't know if it's now. I've got two net short of long portfolios, so I just covered one of a couple. And uh, like you said, you got the metric down here, like seven and a half P. Things started to get very cheap, and then after now, you're kind of just waiting on like market sentiment on what is going to happen to. So, I don't know where the floor is for something like this. I don't know how much structurally will change the company, versus this is just something that they'll need to wait through. But I think companies like this are going to be ones where there are really good opportunities for a longer term. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I would say this impact of like the previous SARS lasted for six months, and this one is even bigger than SARS. 
and uh, especially like airlines or any kind of travel are being quarantined for at least 14 days before they enter into a new city. So I would put at least one year for the reversion to come back to that level. And if you want to profit for it, I would say like one and a half years. Interesting that you comment on the airlines. American Airlines is trading below its IPO price. Yeah, interesting. Does anyone just think I hate cruising? I, I don't want to own it? Okay. And is that something you feel your generation shares, or is, or is that a personal view? Like, are you worried about demographics, or? I look at it a little differently, thinking of, like, 20 years down the road, water levels, levels will continue to rise, and people are going to think alternatively about how they want to spend their money. So maybe we should all live on a cruise ship. <laughs> the new apartment. <laughs> so that's why I, I wouldn't want to be invested in a uh, travel line that's not necessary, or that's not a, that's a word. It's not a, <laughs> like a, like an airline, like you need to go from point A to point B, but with the cruise, you don't really need to. The scratch there, there you go. Thank you. Okay, and we have orange jacket and then gray. Well, I would, I, well the first thing I, I think my intuition is I'd probably go to multiple year long, but I would look at the consumer behavior first. Ah. Like, what is how is the consumer behavior? I, I don't know. I don't have channel checks. Yeah, I would I would like look at that and how big is that market segment. And then the second thing I would look at is their competitors. Like how how strong like how strong are they and what's the debt structure? Because if their competitors highly leverage and then um, this coronavirus hits, their their market uh, my predict my intuition is that I think their price is going probably gonna come down. But if their um debt structure their capital structure is really good, then they might be able to like the competitors and the competitors back, they might like the competitors might be forced out of the market and then they're gonna they're gonna increase the market share and then that's gonna create value. That's kind of like where I'm going with that. So cruise penetration in the U.S., the stat is 3% of people take a cruise every year. So, yeah, and obviously emerging markets is a growth opportunity for them, too. Um, what are the top uh, orders of the stock? Oh, very interesting, George. So the founding family actually owns 17% of the equity. So... In investing, you always have to make decisions with not enough information, right? And so you never have everything you need at the time. And, um, and so this is why successful investors have a good process. And then there's luck, right? If, if the virus were to disappear tomorrow, the stock price would shoot up. I don't, we don't know that. We don't know how long the virus will be with us. Um, but over time, the best decision makers are investors with the best process and judgment. So let's get, let's get, I'm going to give you a few more facts and we can continue to debate this. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, and actually, for everyone that doesn't believe in active management and value is dead, macro volatility creates micro opportunity. But if it really is not what it appears, right? You don't want to catch a falling knife. And there's a joke about a value investor and a growth investor in the kitchen. And a knife falls off the island and it goes straight through the value investor's foot. And the growth investor says, jeepers, why didn't you move your foot? And the value investor says, I didn't think it'd fall that far. So there's also, when do you get in? I heard, you know, I heard that from the gentleman in the pink shirt. So, Let's look at some valuations, some fundamentals, right? So here's, here are the three listed comps. Um, what strikes you? Who said balance sheet? Are you worried about the balance sheet? It's over there. It's okay, right? There. If you look at your sheet, you have some, a few more stats. Interest coverage is, looks fine to me, right? Um, now, in a worst-case scenario, if earnings were down 50%, do you haircut it? And what does that do to the implied interest coverage? So these are the things you're thinking through. Um, return on equity. Interesting. So keep that in mind. Does that look like it's higher than the cost of capital? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, seven times earnings, six percent dividend yield. Um, so we have to take a view on how sustainable that dividend yield is. But all in all, for a business that we all think will be here in 25 years, and we might need if the water levels keep rising, as the gentleman in the back <laughs> said, this is kind of interesting. Insider ownership in Royal Caribbean and Carnival, you know, 16, 13 percent. So the question becomes, is it too soon to board? Right? And I, we heard that. What, when do you get in? When do you cover your short? At what point is it along? Okay. So year to date, this stock is down 40%. I put this together this morning and it was, so, um, you know, Sir John Templeton was once asked, what's cheap? And I think he said down 80%, <laughs> but, you know, these are, these are big moves. And if people think markets are efficient, I would challenge them and say, well, last week, was it 20% overpriced? Or this week is it 20% underpriced? Like, what new information did you really have the last week that has so fundamentally changed your opinion? Did you really think that SARS would stay in China? It's kind of a preposterous thought when you think about it. People travel, right? Um, so interesting. This is someone said, well, I'd look to see what happened in prior crises, right? So on there, the blue line is 9-11. Um, we have SARS on there. What's well, already had a worse reaction than during SARS. Who remembers the green line, Costa, Concordia? Do you remember what that was? <laughs> Who wants to share what that was? That was the Italian uh, cruise ship that got stuck on the rocks because the captain was drunk. Yep, and no one was ever gonna cruise again, right? Yeah, okay. So I guess the point is markets have short memories and Carnival will tell you their clients do too. So I think some of the incrementally bad news is that what they're fearing now with the spread outside of China is people won't book and you tend to book many months out and then that affects their summer period, which is their busiest period. Um, and when it was just China, actually, if you look on the back of your sheet, I think it has geographic um, spread of the business. It's primarily a North American revenue generating business, so it wasn't that impactful. So, you know, things have changed. But this gives you a sense for past crises and stock performance. Price to book. So it's now trading below book value. Does anyone know what that means? What's book value? Yeah, let's take someone who hasn't had a shot yet. If you sell all the assets, tell the liability. Yeah, so now we're getting to replacement costs. We're getting to, right? We're getting to um, liquidation value thinking and. Um, and companies that, whose ROE, right, are generating higher returns than the cost of their capital, typically shouldn't trade at a discount to book value. So these are the disconnects you start looking for. Um, so it's only been cheaper once, and that was in 2008. Why? Oh, here we go. This is e enterprise value to ship to birth. It's never been cheaper on that metric. Interesting. Here we look at PE. So what you can see here is it is trading at greater than a standard deviation away from its mean. So it's cheap by historical standards. And so then you have to start asking yourself, well, why? And actually, it's been cheap for the last year relative to historical standards. So why? What's happening? Who, has, who can think about why that might be? Yes? The management has changed the philosophy, or the company has changed direction, and they're maybe just being used as a cash machine now, as opposed to, like, so they're not interested in the 
growing market share in folks is changing. Okay, so capital allocation or strategy? Strategy. Strategy, okay. Can anyone else think of what might cause weakness? Could it be also related to economic factors? Because cruise ship, um, well, I don't know, I, I think it's a discretionary expense. Therefore, if you have less income, disposable income, less money you will assign for this. There is a lot of uh, talking about the where we learn the level and then there are many countries that are <coughs> who, who grow for the in China, which has been the main model mm -hmm. for the world uh, growth, has been uh, decreasing. Well, the growth is not as big as before. It has been with other countries, US included. Absolutely. Taking a cruise is discretionary, 100%. Um, but mind you, don't we have all time record low unemployment? All right, so, but exactly. So you have to start thinking about why. And, uh, and so everything has a bull and bear case. So if we look at demand, uh, demand for cruising tends to go up 6% a year, compound annually. Um, and so here you see the growth of the industry. Are we happy with that trajectory? Is that okay? Yeah, okay. But supply has been coming on just as fast. And so this is what's happening. And this is why margins have compressed a bit. Um, and so if you're growing supply as fast or faster than demand, um, that's what everyone's ultimately concerned about in the industry here. So here you see the global order book of a ship. The global order book today is equivalent to 41% of current capacity. And here we talked about demographics, right? The average age of the cruiser. It's 50, 56 in the UK, and it hasn't really changed. So you're right, they're having trouble with the millennial. We asked about the dividend. You know, the, the company, the balance sheet's okay, but it's a capital intensive business. So actually, if you look out for the next three years, their dividend isn't quite covered. So how big of an issue is that? This company has an A minus credit rating. In fact, one of their bonds trades at a negative interest rate. So, um, interesting. The last one's a fascinating point, and this is the ESG. And it's cruise shaming, right? Is it an unsustainable way to travel? Um, and so, when these are the things that the street's throwing up as the bull and bear case. Um, so, and then, but the, the, the catalyst for the sell-off was the coronavirus. So I came across these statistics yesterday, and I thought they were kind of interesting. In 2017-18, the flu season saw symptoms in 45 million Americans, and there were 61,000 deaths. So, Blues have been around, so maybe, you know, I'm, I'm saying that this is a human tragedy, we have to be very nervous about it, but what we're reading is statistically, if you have no pre-existing condition and you contract the coronavirus, the probability of dying is less than 1%. And meanwhile, the markets have sold off, what, almost 15% now? So is it an overreaction? Is this a case of micro volatility creating, macro volatility creating micro opportunity? And you never have all the answers. And I think that's what I want you to take away. And there's no right or wrong answer. If you're being pushed for a return within a month, you might not buy Carnival Cruise Line. But if you're thinking about the quarter century, not the quarter, it's probably a pretty safe bet. Um, so, I just say, I guess I'll, I'll leave you with a thought and then we'll go to Q&A. The goal of investing is to find situations where the odds are in your favor. In other words, you're looking for mispricing. And you often hear people say, Apple's a great company with a bright future, I love their product, so I bought the stock. They're betting on their favorite product, but investing is not a matter of what you buy, it's what you pay for it. 
buying shares in companies whose products you like is not enough. You need to consider valuation and the margin of safety as well. Successful value investors get excited when the ratio between their upside and downside price target scenarios is favorable. At Wincrest, I want somebody to have three times the upside to one times the downside. That's where I get comfortable. You're waiting for that slow pitch, right? Things are selling off every day and you don't hit all of them. Um, so, and when you're looking for those favorable opportunities, it might be a company whose securities are cheap enough to more than compensate for their poor, poor prospects, which is what we're talking about here with Carnival. Or they might be one where the future is exceptionally bright, but its securities aren't priced high enough to fully charge for that potential, right? So underappreciated growth can be value too. Um, so success in investing does not come from buying good things it comes from buying things well. And it's essential to know the difference. Okay, so why don't we open it up to questions. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Very good talk. My question is about your investment in the um, Saudi Arabian women's gym. So when you decide to invest in a privately traded company that's also um, in a country like Saudi Arabia, which is like a relatively closed economy, I guess I have a two-part question. First is, what was your thought process about, okay, when we're ready to exit, how are we going to exit from this investment? And the second question is, let's say you get into a dispute with the founder and you're in a foreign country using the Saudi Arabian courts. Are you worried about like, the courts being impartial towards them versus you? Yeah, so really interesting question. Um, it is a publicly listed security, so I have liquidity. Um, and, you know, although we adopt a private market approach to the public equity markets, Right, I think that's a good thing. But I think having liquidity is really good too. For the point, remember my slide about disruption, making life cycles shorter? So I think if you adopt a private market approach to the public equity markets, it's a real advantage. So you're right, if it were a private investment and I didn't have liquidity, right, it could be, we could end up in court, et cetera. But thankfully I can press a button and sell. No, great question. So do they trade uh, in the local markets or also yeah. in their listed? No, local. local. Yeah. Some, of our, some of our companies also have a London listing or an ADR, but um, that's actually local. So the financials are in English or local? Yes. Yeah. English. <laughs> and you trust the financials? I've spent a lot of time with the CFO. And <laughs> okay, so you... The other thing, George, so I've invested in that industry in lots of countries. So I have an understanding of what the margin should be, which is also helpful, right? So if something's out of whack, I'm, how, did you, how are you getting a higher margin than they are in the UK? Explain that. So, and that's where you're just doing a different level of due diligence. Um, I, we were at, I just had dinner before, and I was talking about meeting this management company, and the CFO turned around to me and said, what, are you trying to compete with me? And because I was asking him about, you know, how he incentivizes his employees, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess he thought the questions were quite granular. And uh, I said, no, I'm just trying to figure out if I want to buy your company, buy your stock, right? So, yeah, when you know an industry well, it's easier to get comfortable in foreign countries. Thank you so much for being here today. My question is regarding our, sorry, one sec. Uh, regarding our economy, like in Canada. So we've been impacted a lot by these oil prices. Uh, so my question is, do you find value in, in, our, in our own stocks, more particularly in the oil sector? Hmm. Um, I'm short one of your stocks. <laughs> um, it is the world's largest maker of newsprint. Um, I don't currently have any longs in Canada. I have, um, but not today. Is, is there any reason why? Because like, I see like, the United States were expanded. Uh, Canada's kind of been left in the dark. Uh, like, so I kind of, especially because you're saying the emerging market is a new place to put your money in, and a lot of portfolio managers have been saying that. So I kind of want to feel like why is Canada being neglected in that sense when there's great companies here as well? 
it, Canada does have great companies. Um, how do I say? So, yes, your economy has been hit by lower resource prices, right? Um, I have been a little concerned with your housing market, um, but the country has great prospects. Um, I have held Canadian stocks before, I just don't have a strong enough view right now. But I typically don't have a macro view, it's typically you know, a, a fundamental um, equity story that gets me excited. Um, and so I did get excited, it just happened to be a short, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, thank you again for um, coming here to speak to us. Um, I think guess I've heard similar sentiment about the investment in emerging markets, especially since they're a bit more unstructured, a bit more retail investors in it, mm -hmm. so there's a bit more opportunity. But I guess the question I was asking was, how do you balance that risk? Um, obviously, there's more opportunity for growth there, but there's a lot of trade-offs in terms of like changing regulations. The capital markets aren't as structured, so a lot of changes can be made there, as well as um, I guess you, there, um, I guess like accounting is not as um, structured as like America, so there could be changes in terms of like differences that can be seen there, and how do we know that's accurate and kind of like trade off and risks there? So how do you think about that? So a few things. Um, you can't control every risk, but you can diversify it. So no one country, my exposure to any individual country could not blow up my fund, if you will, right? So that's one way. Diversification is a great risk management tool. Um, secondly, 80% of the stocks in my fund have the founder as the largest shareholder. That's not perfect alignment. Sometimes they can treat it as a piggy bank, but that's what you're going to go meet them about. Right? You, you, that's something you can get a little sense for if you meet multiple layers of management, what's the company culture, um, talk to the supply chain. This is what the, this is what the Go See research is all about. Um, in terms of the financials, um, you know, you look for big name auditors, right? You, there's some red flags. You look for creative accounting. Um, again, not perfect, but Emerging markets do not have a monopoly on risk, right? Brexit was a pretty big risk. Um, you know, Valiant was a risk. Um, so you do your best, and I, I think taking the time to do the homework and the due diligence is what saves you. Um, if you can mitigate your losses, the upside tends to take care of itself. So it's avoiding, avoiding the blow-ups, right? Um, you know, the other thing is a lot of the category killers in emerging markets, right, the companies with great moats, the consumer stories, they're not in the indexes. You've got to go a layer deeper. Um, and that's fine. That's our opportunity, right? It, it, it's, I don't believe markets are perfectly efficient. So if you can f find that gem and own it, it's a great thing. All right. Um, thank you for coming. Um, do you have a time horizon for when um, there's going to be a reallocation of capital to emerging markets? Because um, it's a, a reallocation of capital sure. to emerging markets, because it seems like um, there's a bit of a home bias whereby um, investors in the West ignore attractive investments, high yields, um, people are happy to invest in negative yields in the US or in Europe and ignore like um, attractive, attractive yields in, in Asia. So, and I also wanted to get a sense of what you think um, the drivers of this uh, reallocation will be. Yeah, love it. So in my experience, things can be safe or they can be popular. They're rarely both. Right now, the US market is safe. I mean, it's popular and as a result, it's expensive and therefore, in my opinion, it's not safe. Um, so I'm finding literally twice the growth for half the multiple in emerging markets um, in parts of Europe. Um, so what is the catalyst for reallocation? It should be valuation, right? So I think today, the average portfolio is 13% in emerging markets. It's pretty low. Um, you know, at the beginning of this year, BlackRock said they were 
reallocating their portfolios to more emerging markets. Why? On valuation. So, so, so that's, so yes, people, you know, there's a flight of safety, people want to go to the U.S. market, but if it's driven up to levels that are so expensive, is it safe? Right? So it always comes down to, to fundamentals. Um, I personally think we're overdue for that reallocation of capital. And that's how my portfolio is positioned. In my fourth quarter letter, I just said, you know, I, fourth quarter was a period of waiting. You know, I, we, we, we didn't change the way we were allocated. Um, so we, and it takes a long time to build a portfolio, particularly if you do it the way we do and you're literally doing boots on the ground research, going to all these countries and companies. We couldn't replicate our portfolio overnight. It's a bit like driving a tanker, right? So um, we feel we're well positioned. We wholeheartedly agree with you that um, there is better growth um, and valuation ex-US. Um, and so I hope you're right. <laughs> um, hi, thank you very much. I just want to discuss with you about the market overall. Because uh, and also the impact of coronavirus on the market, uh, a lot of institutions have declared their uh, opinions that the impact of coronavirus is just temporary, and the they haven't brought too much concern about it. But given the performance today, everything is down, right? And apparently, if you look at the PE of the crop, uh, crop rate uh, America, the PE ratio has been at its all-time high. If you look at the industry uh, average, and also. According to John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, the methodology that he used to evaluate the, the return, the true return, if you invest in the market, is essentially three things. The dividend of corporate America at the beginning of the year, and also the uh, growth in earning, and also the last one would be the increase in PE. And if you look at the, uh, research, uh, the statistics, whatever, uh, you will find out that the growth in the uh, corporate America is not actually growing anymore, but the, if you look at the index, is we have been undergoing the longest bull market since like 10 years ago. And do you think this is the right time to short the American market? And I'm not, uh, I'm saying like, because of the coronavirus, would that be a trigger for a timing to short corporate, uh, to short the, uh, American market, especially because a lot of people are saying like there's a bubble recently, but there are not like those people who are willing to short the uh, the in, uh, the market are not too brave to short right now because they are still afraid of the upside risk whatever. So do you think this is going to be a good time to short? So there's a lot in that question. Let's unpack it. Um, <laughs> you're right. Last year the S and P was up. Who knows? Thirty percent exactly. Earnings were flat. It was multiple expansion. So that means people were willing to pay more for the same level of earnings. I'm a value investor. I want to pay less, not more. So absolutely. So growth is slowing in the U.S. And you know, Buffett just literally came out two days ago. I watched an interview he did, and you know, he has a great cross section on the economy. With and he said he owns 70 businesses, and he said, off a high base, but we're slowing. Um, Okay, so yes, U.S. is slowing. Yes, multiples are elevated. Is coronavirus a catalyst for shorting? So markets are driven by two things, greed and fear. Of the two, who can tell me which is the most, more powerful? Fear. fear. That's why the market was down 5%. Today, yesterday, has the market been up 5% <laughs> right? in, any, in anyone's um, recent mis history, memory? So um, I don't think you do much during periods of extreme fear. If anything, you're buying. And this is where doing your homework matters. So in my opinion, risk is not volatility, it's permanent impairment of capital. Does that make sense? So if the coronavirus were going to permanently impair a business, i.e. it was going to zero for something, <clears throat> which I can't think of one, that would be different than 
impairing the earnings for two quarters, maybe three quarters of Carnival. Does that make sense? Uh, kind of. Because I'm saying like, because essentially I'm saying like, well, apparently, if you look at the growth of the uh, entire American industry, the growth has been stagnating for a while. And if you look at the major index, S&P 500, Dow Jones, whatever, is all shooting high. That's like contradictory to the fundamental facts that's laid out in the American industry. So my question is actually, I wouldn't say coronavirus is going to cause the market to go down, whatever. I'm saying like, is that going to be a trigger that is going to cause people to actually start to short the, uh, the, the, mar to short the market as they have been always talking about there's a bubble in, 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 in the industry. And, and also I said that a lot of like institutions, whatever, banks, whatever, hedge funds, there are, for example, Ray, uh, uh, Ray Dalio recently said that you have to, like the mechanism in America has been wrongful somehow. The reason why is the growth in America has been stagnating for a while. And he, what he's essentially saying is the opportunities for investment are laying in emerging markets like China because he got like personal. So let me take that because there are a lot of pieces in that. So let me just hit them. Um, what has changed is the price of money. So when you're doing a DC, negative interest rates, it's like taking your DCF and saying you can divide by zero. So that's causing problems for how you value companies. What's the discount rate? So that might explain some of the, um, you know, uh, of the market's rise. Two, I think we got to look at passive investing. It's kind of interesting if you deconstruct the index. It's not every company was up thirty percent, right? There are a lot of companies like a Carnival asset heavy traditional industries that run nine, 10 times earnings. So now that you have 51% of, or more than 50% of the assets in passive, do the big companies in the indexes just keep getting bigger? And is it indiscriminate? And it would be, so basically every 10 years, the amount of money in passives has doubled. So it's like doubling the number of people in the theater every 10 years, but there's still only one exit door. So now when everyone panics and hits the, door to, hits the button to sell and is trying to get out that door, that's where you see the fear set in and the indiscriminate selling. So we might be seeing some of that. And quite frankly, I think some volatility is great. It gives active management an opportunity to shine. And I hope hedge funds do very well in this environment because it's been very hard to be expected to have a low net exposure and beat the market, right? And so, so hedge, funds have have a, hedge funds, which is the most active, right, of, of investing, they've had a, 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 people have sort of lost hope in them over the last 10 years, but it hasn't really been the most representative environment. So thank you. Uh, thanks so much for coming. This was super helpful. Um, you, you talked a lot about boots on the ground and you know talking to management teams and getting to know them, um, and how that's like almost like your differentiator, and, and that's how you get to know the most about businesses. Um, that can be quite difficult, like as a student and as a like you know somebody without those resources. So maybe if you were to imagine yourself in our shoes, what would your process be to evaluate management teams from like an outsider's perspective? Okay. Um, so I guess it, as a student, I would question what resources you have access to, right? There are some, we tend to do all, a lot of our own research in-house, we build our own LBO models, but there are some research houses that you may tend to agree with the analysts, right, that um, could accelerate your research thinking or um, process around a company. Um, I'm a big fan of going through 10Ks. There's stuff in there that's not in the glossy annual report. Um, go through the financials. I mean, if you have some accounting experience, you know, when we talk about adjusted anything, that's always a red flag. 
Nobody adjusts up. Everyone, <laughs> I mean, everyone adjusts up. Someone, no one adjusts down. So um, I think at, at, at your stage, like I, I think it's laudable and applaudable that you are looking at companies and investing. Um, I'd be really focused in, on the process, um, the methodology, valuation, and thinking of if it doesn't work, celebrate. What did you learn? Because that's how you get to be a good investor. Um, sorry, that's probably not helpful, but. Hi, Barbara. Thanks again for coming in. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I guess I want to ask a bit about your um, approach to short investing because it's something we typically don't hear about a lot from value investors. Um, so your approach, as I understand it, is kind of a fundamental approach to short investing, looking for the melting ice cubes or the businesses that will deteriorate. Um, I guess like my question is around um, businesses that might be melting ice cubes can be overpriced for a long period of time, and the types of people who push those prices up will like continue to push them up, especially if you have a significant amount of passive investors. So um, how do you kind of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how do you kind of approach um, short selling? Is there a market timing approach or like perspective to it? Or Yeah, so the difference between a long and a short is catalyst, right? Um, on a short, you have a cost to borrow. So for starters, right, it's not free. So, um, so you want being timely is more important. So identifying the catalyst is more important. And that catalyst c could be when they report. It could be the FDA is announcing X. It could be, right, um, you think they're going to lose a lawsuit. It could be. Um, a new competitor is coming in and taking their market share. Um, but that's something that we try to be very disciplined about, is what is the catalyst. Um, because a short, I mean, they can double on you, right? It can be, uh, the other thing you want to be really careful about is, is it a buyout candidate? Right? I mean, gosh. Shorts are, I, I love shorting. Um, but there is definitely an art to it. Um, and again, when you get it wrong, it's really important to do the, the post-mortem and, and think about why. Um, you know, we were short, we were short, you know, mall companies, for example. And uh, very sound process, logic, but one of the companies was bid for. Well, if you're trading below book value and somebody has a view, well, may, you know, the bid didn't go through, and now it's well below where we shorted it, but these things can happen, right? So you want to be really thoughtful about timing, catalyst, um, short interest, right? Do you know what that is? Yes, yeah, so the percentage of short. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, valuation shorts are hard because things can be expensive for a long time. It's better when there's something structural. You want, you, you want many ways to win. Does that make sense? Right? You, want, you want it to be over levered. You want the management to not be uh, top of their game. You, you, you want some funny accounting. You want competitors coming in. You, you want as many things to go against you as possible. Right? That's going to line up. That's going to put the odds in your favor. Um, and, then, and then sometimes, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just have to wait, right? Because you can be early, um, and if it has a dividend yield, that hurts, and if the cost of borrow is expensive, that hurts. So timing is much more important. Um, the other thing is, if a, if a short goes against you, it becomes larger in your portfolio, right? It's the inverse. <laughs> and um, so one of the things that we try to be disciplined about is saying, when we put that short in, it was 2%. Keep it at 2%. Because if it's up 50%, it's now a 3% position. <laughs> oh, and you like it more. No. You know? So you have to, be, they have, to have some, some rules in place about you know, how much exposure <coughs> and how you're going to you know, think about risk management.
Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll begin with a quote that you, you just said a few minutes back, and I found it really wonderful, which was, um, this world is a very big world, but if you're looking for something specific, um, it's not that big. Um, and you also mentioned a lot about the process. Um, my question to you was, there's so many value investors. I personally, you know, I'm a big fan of Buffett, um, and I totally follow his ideology. But out of all the value investors, like, what do you think in the process has worked for you? Because you must have gone through the process many times when you're valuing a company. So what has worked for you? And if you could give us an advice on that. So what's worked best for me throughout my career on the long side is looking for characteristics of a good LBO candidate. Why? Um, because sales tend to be growing. Anything that's not growing is dying. Right? So you want the, it's the right trajectory. Um, if you can see a way that margins could be made higher, that's a good thing. If they don't have a lot of debt, that's a good thing. Um, if they're trading below private market valuation <laughs> comp levels, that's a good thing. And so what you're trying to do is build your, build your margin of safety. And inevitably, if you're picking companies with these characteristics, right, good company in a good industry, great balance sheet, there's some cost rationalization that you can see happening, private equity sees the same thing. Private equity right now is, they're giddy. They've got a lot of dry powder. And as we were talking about, not every company in the index is on 30 times earnings. There's a whole slew of companies that weren't taken up by this indiscriminate money that have hung out here at 10 times earnings for a long time. And I was talking to someone very senior at Apollo, and he just said it was wonderful. <laughs> he was so excited about the opportunity. And I said, yeah, but I own all that stuff, and I need you to come buy it for price discovery because this stuff is not in the indices. So this buy verification is quite interesting in creating interesting opportunities. And again, it comes back to what's your time horizon, right? If, if, if you need to make money in the quarter, well, then you just better buy the index, you're not going to underperform. If you want alpha, and you have a longer time horizon, you can do more unique things. And just another quick question. How do you set your margin of safety? Like right now, we're assuming a standard, like one third. Um, but yeah. how, much, like how do you determine that? Is that industry specific? How do you go about that? Great. So every industry would have different drivers, right? But what you'd want to do is haircut your assumptions for worst case scenario. Okay, so, uh, I mean, we can take any industry, but take a cruise liner. If, okay, let's think of our worst case scenario, help me. It's not going to sail for six months, a year. They're going to have to refund all the money. What could happen? Uh, two years doesn't sell. Two years doesn't sell, okay. Price of oil is low today. That's a benefit for them. Could go up to 75, right? So you can try to stress test for all the things that could go wrong and, and, and discount the cash flows for that. So you, and then, or you can say, okay, in 2008, it's only been cheaper once. In 2008, okay, let's put it on the multiple it was on in 2008, right? Let's, and so you play with the worst case scenario, um, and that's a way of coming up with the downside. Um, the other one, and I keep going back to it, is if things get too cheap, private equity will come in. Right? They need to make, they need to buy cheap, sell high, they're trying to make a return, they've got lots of cash. So if something falls below the private market value, that's, that's always quite interesting. Um, and you, know, you look at a lot of these IPOs, and what are they saying? They're saying we can't come to market. We're worth more in the private market. Right? It's a problem. These we, we works, right? Public market wouldn't pay for it. So. Um, so yeah, so worst case scenario analysis on multiple and earnings, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, hi, uh, thanks again for coming out. Uh, it was really cool to hear um, your thoughts on the current situations and your investment philosophy. I guess one thing that me and my peers sometimes really struggle with is like achieving confidence in our investment theses or our view of the market. Um, I was just wondering from your perspective, what I guess, rule of thumb or what like indicators do you look for to give you confidence in what you're investing in? And I, and I guess, for example, looking at um, 
the case study here. Um, like personally, if I looked at a 10% drop in Dow that just recently happened, I wouldn't really be confident in like exploring an investment opportunity because I really don't know the virus. Uh, I, don't th I don't think anyone knows the virus. And um, I tend to like avoid like top down to investing and try to go with bottom up. So I was just wondering on your side, like what are, what are like, the rule of thumbs that gives you confidence in your investment and helps you stick it out? So it's a beautiful question to end with. Um, value investing is not about emotion, it's about math. So if you've done the homework and you see, you, you're confident that your worst case scenario, right, is not far away, or it's trading on net net cash, or right. So then you have to not worry about it. But the emotion, the Jim Cramer, sell, 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 and it's taking over the world, and right, that's what gets your emotions going. And that's what's so hard about value investing. It's not intuitive, it's counterintuitive. It's the revulsion trade, right? Your stomach's turning as you're pressing buy. But and that's unique to value investing. Growth investors, right? <laughs> Yeehaw, right? So, um, so you're on to something. And, and uh, you know, so you don't have to have a view on everything, but you have to have a view on something. So do the homework that enables you to build the conviction that settles your stomach. OK, well, uh, we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask the last question. Uh, so. What is the most important thing you learned in life and investing over the last 20 years? So in investing, it is definitely manage the downside. The losers do not compound well, right? Um, and if you manage the downside, the upside tends to take care of itself. Um, Personally, what have I learned over the last 20 years? Um, when you're a student, I think you, or I thought, that maybe success looked like, well, if we had a graph, a straight line. It would just be a 45 degree angle. And it's not. The direction's right, but it's more like this. And if you can face the downtimes with gratitude for the struggle, it helps you to not only go through it, but grow through it. Because it's the troubling times that help you grow, not the good times.